Hello, everyone. My name is Jack Hanna, a Biden delegate and a former chair of the Pennsylvania Democratic State Committee and also its treasurer. Uh, welcome uh, to the Coalition for a National Infrastructure Banks webinar on how to create 25 million jobs, uh, including one of the projects being a high-speed rail system. Uh, we're, uh, our presentation today uh, will include union leaders, elected officials, and other authorities. Please note that the uh, panelists' initial presentations uh, uh, will occur first, and then we will go to a question and answer session and request that uh, you place those questions in the Q&A portion of the Zoom site. Uh, we're very pleased to start off today uh, uh, with our first panelist, who is a sponsor of legislation to create the National Infrastructure Bank, which is HR 6422. And uh, we are joined today by Congressman Danny Davis from Illinois, uh, the sponsor. And uh, welcome, Congressman. We're pleased to have you join us today. And the floor is yours. Well, Jack, thank you very much. And let me just say that I am delighted to be with all of you. And of course, you got my attention when you first started to introduce yourself, saying that you were a Biden delegate. And, and I said, hey, I'm in the right place. <laughs> I don't have any qualms about where I am and the people that I'm interacting with. I know that my, my, my staff person who's been working on this issue, Caleb Gilchrist, has uh, been totally enthralled with the work that all of you have been doing. And I don't think he ever misses a day of mentioning something to me about the new National Infrastructure Bank and the fact that we're talking about not only fulfilling a great need. All of us, nobody have to convince us, nobody have to tell us that our infrastructure is in bad shape in the country. First thing I heard, I think, when I got here 20 years ago was how bad off we were in terms of infrastructure our bridges, roads, highways, sidewalks, alleys. As a matter of fact, I used to live on a street that had a WPA alley, which really means that we didn't have an alley. And I had to convince my neighbors, let's put up a little bit of money because they were going to give us a special assessment and we had to pay a part of what it was going to take to just get a new alley or an alley put in because the area had never had one. It had just kind of a little drove through where garbage trucks could come. So we know the need. Every time we talk now about relief from from, from the coronavirus or the pandemic, and we talk about programs, some of us will say, and I often say it, that the best possible program for people is a job, the opportunity to work. And so we're talking about creating an opportunity for millions of individuals across the country to have meaningful work. But we're also talking about the help that it would provide and give to the economy. Because people who work spend the money that they earn. So whatever it is that they get, they put right back into the economy. And I don't know about the way some people think, but I always think that if you want to do economic development, putting money in, taking money out, moving money around, having money touch different entities and different people is what keeps an economy going. 
what keeps it thriving, what keeps it moving. And that's what the infrastructure bank will do. I am pleased that we, we now, in most of the meetings that I attend, somebody will mention infrastructure redevelopment. And there's generally a healthy conversation about it, which means if people are talking about something, then they feel that there's the possibility of it happening. I am very optimistic because I believe that we're going to see some changes come November, and we're going to come back here in January with a Democratic House, a Democratic Senate, and a Democratic President, and I can't think of any particular reason with that configuration of leadership in the country that we will not be able to be big and bold, get a, a national infrastructure program going, get the economy moving. And I'm hoping that the folks in Illinois at the university will have discovered or come up with a vaccine that works. And I only say that because they're in my district and they're working hard on a vaccine and they think that they're pretty close to having something that's going to work. So Jack and group, thank you all so much. It's a pleasure being with you. And of course, I'm going to have to get to Chicago. You know, there's a song we sing, say, going to Chicago. Sorry, but I can't take you. But I'm going to try to get a flight out of here tonight because I've got some early morning activity. Thank you all so much. It's a pleasure working with you. And I just got a good feeling that we're going to make this happen. Have a good evening. We'll see some of you next week, perhaps. But if not, we'll be at that swearing-in ceremony, Jack. <laughs> no matter what the weather is, we'll be there. Right on. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman, for joining us. And I join you in those wishes as far as Inaugural Day is concerned, that's for sure. All righty. Uh, next, we're going to go to our first panelist. Uh, uh, who is Alfeca Mutardi, who is a macroeconomist, who's going to give an explanation uh, briefly with regard to how uh, the National Infrastructure Bank functions and operates and how it will be funded without creating additional national debt. Alfeca, you're up. Thank you very much, Jack. So um, I'm a macroeconomist, and uh, my contribution uh, to this uh, National Infrastructure Bank effort has been to, to uh, estimate out what will be the effects of uh, such bank and what kind of infrastructure can it cover. Um, we've actually had four of these banks in our nation's past, uh, starting with the first bank of the United States under Alexander Hamilton and ending with uh, FDR's uh, Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which was a huge bank. Uh, that really actually helped us to get out of the depression and win World War II. This bank, uh, as, as set out in HR 6422, would uh, be enacted as a mixed ownership public bank to lend up to $4 trillion in infrastructure. Uh, and uh, this go around, what we've done is to ask ourselves the question, if we were not constrained by uh, any kind of budgets or anything like that, what would it take to fix everything? And we went to the American Society of Civil Engineers who said four years ago that we need $4.6 trillion to fix everything. And of that, maybe half was funded, but the other half definitely not funded. So this bank will cover that. And then in addition, we wanted to cover things that are not covered by uh, the engineers' typical um, uh, analyses. And they, they include high-speed rail, uh, uh, at least uh, 9,000 miles of high-speed rail lines in the United States, uh, broadband everywhere in rural areas and underserved areas, uh, affordable housing. We need at least 7 million units. We're really behind on affordable housing. And uh, then um, um, some large water projects as well. Uh, but I have to say 
that those numbers are now four years old. And while we have $4 trillion in our bank at the moment, the engineers are now coming out with new estimations of infrastructure needs where the figures are much, much higher. For example, the financing gap for roads, uh, roads and bridges, they've now doubled. The financing gap for the electricity grid, they've now doubled. And the financing gap for water infrastructure has gone up tenfold. So I think uh, in all uh, reality, we're going to have to expand the size of this bank. But even so, let me discuss the, the four trillion at the moment. Uh, this bank is, works just like a commercial bank. It's, um, uh, it lifts the whole responsibility for infrastructure financing off of the budgets and places it into this infrastructure bank. It's capitalized with private uh, holdings of treasuries uh, and, uh, and it earns uh, interest earnings on its loans, but very rock bottom interest rates because we wanted to keep financing costs low. And uh, what it does is not uh, on a net basis, does not require any monies coming from the federal budget. Uh, it doesn't uh, require new taxes or create new debt. And we think that that would really be appealable to, to folks on both sides of the aisle because everyone agrees. We know we need infrastructure. We need a lot of it, but we don't have a mechanism for how to pay for it. And that's what this bank would do. And by the way, when you're busy spending $4 trillion fixing and repairing and building out new infrastructure, uh, guess what? You're going to be hiring at least 25 million workers all across the country paying them Davis-Bacon wages. They will, these will be full-time construction jobs that will, for which uh, folks will get uh, training and permanent construction jobs with full benefits. And that will go a long way to solving our economic dilemma, both uh, that was in place before coronavirus and since coronavirus, where we now have at least 30 million folks receiving assistance of some kind or another. So that's it in a nutshell. And we wanted to turn it back to Jack. Uh, so. Um, so he can uh, invite the other speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Alpaca. Next, we're going to go to our panelist, Senator Lou De Palma from Rhode Island, uh, uh, who um, is going to now make his presentation. Uh, Senator, uh, Thank you, you're Jack. up. Thank you, Thank you, Jack. It's great to be a part of the group. I am in the Rhode Island Senate serving my uh, sixth term, my 12th year. I'm a senior deputy majority leader. I uh, hopefully uh, the Congressman was still on the line because he would give it another cheer. I am also a Biden delegate and co-chair of, of the Rhode Island Biden campaign. So it's a, we're looking for a big, uh, big win in, a, in a, a few weeks here. We, as Alfec indicated, as Jack indicated, as the Congressman indicated, we have critical infrastructure needs across the country. Nobody disagrees about the why and the need for a national infrastructure bank. We in Rhode Island have been fortunate, uh, and I've been a part of it, we, in fact, have a Rhode Island infrastructure bank, nowhere near to the tune of $4 trillion, nowhere in that vicinity. But we do have a uh, Rhode Island infrastructure bank, which the municipalities and the state have benefited from immensely over the many years we've had it. We just saw flashed up there the city of Providence, the largest city in the state of Rhode Island, while the smallest state, not the smallest state by population in any means, but the city of Providence just passed a resolution in support of the legislation. It's extremely beneficial. The work of Congressman uh, Davis and uh, Seth Moulton is critical, and we need a national infrastructure bank now more than ever. And I look forward to bring, helping bring this over the goal line. Thank you, Jack. Jack, you're on Jack, mute. Jack, you're on mute. Sorry, my apologies. Thank you very much. Senator, greatly appreciate your comments. Next, we have Ryan Snow up and uh, you're on. Take it away, Ryan. And he's as good at, at hey. muting as I am. I'm all unmuted, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with the, the panelists this evening. Um, I'm the, the California State Legislative Board Chairman for the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen. We've been on board with High Speed Rail in California. California is a huge state. Uh, we cannot, I, I cannot express the importance of, of funding for our high speed rail throughout California and other entities. Um, this, this project moving forward will mean a lot. Um, high Speed Rail, as you know, has been being built here in California 
It's almost all the way through the city of Fresno, which is amazing if you drive through 99 up the valley here. I, I get to see it about every two weeks when I, on my way to Sacramento. It is enormous. And we, uh, I, I just wanted to tell you that, that the airlines are going to love this because it'll free up their, their, uh, their spaces for uh, longer flights. We're going to have all this commuter traffic is going to be on the, the trains. And anybody that has taken a train knows there's no TSA. And it's so nice not taking off your shoes to travel. So uh, again, thank you for letting me be here. Great. Thank you very much, Ryan. appreciate your comments. And uh, our panelists will also be answering questions later on. Uh, during our webinar and be giving closing statements in addition to that. Uh, our next speaker will be Jason Parker from Virginia, who's a member of the AFL-CIO's leadership. Uh, Jason, take it away. Evening everybody, my name is Jason Parker, President of Virginia State Building Construction Trades Council, 30-year electrician, 30-year member of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, proud member of the AFL-CIO for the state of Virginia. You know, when we talk about infrastructure, um, on top of just the jobs that you get from construction and the velocity of money from those jobs, at the very end of that, the ma a major consideration that you have to think about is that America's lost 60,000 manufacturers over the last two decades. And when you bring back manufacturers, one of the biggest considerations is infrastructure. And we need to have those jobs back. Manufacturing jobs are good middle-class jobs, they, they are superior to anything you're going to find in the service economy or in the gig economy. Um, those are paths that I have seen lead to further and further separation from the haves and have nots. So this is a way to bring back that manufacturing base. And just to put it in a little bit of perspective, you know, at the beginning of this, this pandemic, we had a number of calls, the AFL-CIO here in the state of Virginia, talking to our senators and our Congress people. And one of the things that came into focus for us was the fact that we had to go back to China and get the, the PPE we needed to protect our citizens here in the state of Virginia. That's how bad our manufacturing base has gotten. And we need to resolve that as a first world country. And I look forward to taking any questions later on. And thank you, Chad. Thank you, Jason. Next, uh, we're going to go to Erica White, uh, who is a communications worker official from Toledo, Ohio. And welcome, Erica. Uh, your turn to speak. Thank you. Thank you, and I, I want to start off by apologizing by not hitting the right button. I thought I was hitting to show my video, and I showed my voice, so I apologize to everyone about that. Um, so if it happens to you, you can be embarrassed as much as I am tonight. So, but my name is Eric Y. I'm the president of Communication Works of America, which is the reason why I should know to hit the mute, right? Um, I am president, also serve as the vice president of the local, uh, our Greater Northwest Ohio AFL-CIO and on the National Executive Board as a diversity member for Communication Works of America. So just by the name alone, I know that, you know, we represent communications, which is broadband, which is the reason I'm on this call. I also live in the northwest corner of Ohio, which is Toledo, Ohio. Let me see if I slide the right way. There it is. So if you see the sign, you're there, right? You have to give a little promo there. OH, I heard it. Yes, IO. So Toledo is about 45 minutes. We're the largest suburb of Detroit, Michigan, right down the street hey, from. Hey, excuse oh. me, Erica, but we have a special guest that's joining us. Oh. Um, uh, so we will uh, come back to you in just a few moments. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to introduce to you uh, another congressman. Uh, who is a co-sponsor of H.R. 6422, uh, legislation that creates a national infrastructure bank. Uh, Congressman Seth Moulton from Massachusetts, welcome. We're so happy to have you join us, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, everybody, so much for having me on. I apologize in advance. But, um, I'm, I just boarded a flight. You can probably hear I'm competing with the announcement in the background, and I'll probably have to jump off shortly. Um, but look, I just want to say that this is an incredibly important initiative. Um, everyone knows we need to, to invest more in our infrastructure, but I think too few talk about the actual funding and financing mechanisms to make those investments. And almost no one is being clear enough that we need investment in 21st century infrastructure, not 20th century infrastructure. We've got to invest in the infrastructure of the future. That's what our adversaries are doing. 
And that's why I'm such a proponent of high-speed rail. We've got to catch up with the rest of the world. We've got to make sure that Americans can get around as fastly, as quickly, as efficiently, um, and as safely as, as people in China and, and everywhere in Europe and, 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 and the rest of Asia. I would love to talk to you more about this. I know I'm competing um, with the announcement in the background, but, uh, but hopefully we'll get to continue this um, this conversation. And, uh, and and just know that I'm a real ally for all the work that you're doing in the United States Congress. I actually uh, am one of the few members of Congress with a background in, in, in physics and actually studied uh, or worked in infrastructure finance um, after business school, um, following it in time serving in the Marines, and, um, and then actually served as the managing director of a high-speed rail project. So I get this at the ground level, and I know we have a lot of work to do. Thank you so much for having me on tonight. Thank you very much, Congressman. We value you, your support and efforts with regard to promoting the National Infrastructure Bank. And we're going to now return uh, to Erica White uh, to have her continue her presentation. Thank you. So as I was saying, thank you. That happened the last call too. So it's like, I, may, I think I'm a superstar or something now. <laughs> but um, we, um, I, as I said, I'm from Toledo, Ohio, Northwest um, part of Ohio, I'm about 45 minutes, largest suburb of Detroit. We're right down the street from Cleveland, Akron and Youngstown. So Northeast, Northwest Ohio, um, who I'm representing as I speak about broadband is of course something that we're using right now to be on this call. It's something we've been using through the, throughout this pandemic. And though we have uh, broadband, the reason why I'm supporting this bill is the disparity in broadband. So that's something that we hear a lot about in, when it comes to jobs or equal pay or even food disparities, but there's disparity in broadband. And where we're really noticing that is an economic growth product productivity in the future and economic development. This is huge. And this is why CWA is on the forefront of pushing for broadband expansion. And what this bill allows is for broadband to continue to build and we've got to invest. Think about it. The United States, we invented the internet. However, we no longer are at the top of our game when it comes to where we are providing high speed internet. So though we have internet and we have broadband, whichever one you would like to refer to it as, if you check your speeds right now, you'll be disappointed. We are not there. So along with high speed rail that is needed to move from, from, I would say from Northeast Ohio to Northwest Ohio and continue to build out our, our communities across Ohio and the Midwest, the most important part is to bring up our broadband speeds because without that, we're putting children behind educationally and we're stopping our economic growth in this country. Thank you very much, Erica. Thank you. Next, uh, we're going to go uh, to a Pennsylvania State House of Representative from the Philadelphia area, Representative Joseph Cerisi. Uh, Joseph, uh, you're up next. Take it away. Well, well, thank you so much, Jack. It's a pleasure to be on this call. I've been on multiple calls with you and a lot of the panelists, and I'm very honored about this. I was honored to hear the Congressman and what he said. Um, a little bit about me. I'm a freshman in the Pennsylvania State House. You may be able to tell from my accent, I'm not a Pennsylvanian by birth. I'm a New Yorker. Um, and train service to me is what brings our communities together. I grew up on Long Island. And the community I currently live in had a, a rail that got, we got rid of. Well, I didn't, but they did in the mid-1980s. Now population has boomed and we have no public transportation. A bill like this not only helps us bring back the rail, but it also helps us bring the infrastructure to our communities. Great jobs. I'm so glad there's so many union people on this call. But more importantly, it helps the youth of America, those children and students who are in our technical schools with great high paying jobs. My father was a union laborer for his whole life. Uh, he only went to the 10th grade. And without that, we wouldn't have had anything. And he worked hard for that. Um, I look forward to supporting this in Pennsylvania and moving this through this great state and seeing us be able to rebuild. We have some of the most efficient uh, bridges in the United States or here in Pennsylvania, unfortunately, uh, because we have so much roadways. This will really be a big help to us and I look forward to supporting you and this project moving forward. Thank you all. Thank you, Representative. And some of you will note uh, on the screen sharing portions of uh, the presentations that we've had there are resolutions that have been posted by the particular um, uh, speakers that have, uh, have already presented today, and you will see more of those uh, from city council, 
uh, the Pennsylvania State Legislature, uh, Ohio Union Organizations, and Virginia, on and on. Uh, next, our says, panel, uh, next, our panelist, uh, uh, Thomas Carey, where do I type in New, New York? And uh, uh, Tom, uh, your turn, take it away. Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, first, I want to welcome all my union brothers and sisters. But uh, sir, I don't see where you type in the name. Home uh, chat. Got somebody coming in. Uh, so I'm, I'm the president of the Westchester and Putnam Central uh, Labor Body AFL-CIO uh, here in Westchester. Uh, uh, I'm also a business representative for the Plumbers and Steve Fitters Local 21. Oh, great. Uh, encompassing Westchester and Putnam counties, which is just outside of the five boroughs of New York City. Uh, I want to thank all my fellow panelists. We've been working very hard on H.R. 6422. Uh, this bill is phenomenal. And, you know, I can't forget all of our elected officials that are on this call, this web chat as well. Uh, many of my officials in Westchester County, Congress, uh, Senate, uh, I, I've got friends from the Westchester County uh, Board of Legislators on here this evening. So I thank you again for all your help because this thing is really starting to pick up steam. You know, we talk about infrastructure and I don't know if everybody looked at the beginning sheet on this uh, webinar this evening, but there's a bridge and that is, uh, that's our bridge. That's the Mario M. Cuomo bridge. That was a $5 billion project labor agreement. And it came at a time when, when the workers all across Westchester and Rockland County, which the bridge, uh, you know, it bridges those two counties, we were probably at a 30 to 40 percent uh, loss of work. And Governor Cuomo stepped in and he said, you know, we've been talking about it, talking about it, it's time to build this bridge. So that was a big infrastructure project, uh, as you can see it up there in your screen. And it was done with a project labor agreement, which helps out everybody. Everybody gets a fair shot at bidding. Uh, it helps out our apprentices. It helps out uh, not just roads and bridges. I mean, you think about our powerhouses, our hospitals. Uh, look at the COVID-19. I mean, we can't even imagine what's going to happen after this pandemic, how much trouble we're going to be in. Everybody's working from home. Uh, meanwhile, all of our infrastructure is still falling apart. There's sections uh, right here in Westchester County and New York City that still has wooden pipes under our roads. If you can believe that in 2020, uh, that's where we're at. So uh, I, I'll be open for questions uh, in a little bit. I thank everybody once again. I thank our panelists. You guys have been phenomenal. We've been working together for quite some time. And I, I look forward to really getting HR 6422 passed. Thank you, Tom. And just wanted to pass on Mary, Shaman Mary Jane Shemansky uh, was on, but had to leave and uh, sends her regards. Uh, next up, we have a state representative from South Carolina, Representative Robert Williams. Robert, your turn. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I want to start out by saying I want to thank every, all the panelists and thank you uh, for those who are on the line. Uh, certainly, this is a great opportunity. Certainly, our country is uh, at a crossroad, and we're, 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 uh, there are some things that we have to do as citizens of this great nation. Um, my name is Robert Williams, and uh, I serve in the House of Representatives. One of the reasons why I was on the line, we were in session today. And matter of fact, we had introduced some bills that deal with broadband here in South Carolina. So evidently, uh, broadband is an issue throughout the nation, not just not just isolated. So, uh, so but we're working hard to make sure we we get broadband to every house here in South Carolina that has electricity. So we want to make sure that happens uh, throughout the state, uh, throughout the country. Um, I just want to say, and I'm going to be brief in my comments, and, and if anyone have questions uh, for me, but I just want to say that uh, we are at a critical structure time here in, in our nation uh, with infrastructure because it's needed all over. Our buildings, our, our water lines, our pipes, uh, our railways, um, our communication system, you know, 
to be to be uh, 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 to live in the free world, it, it seems to me that we shouldn't have to go shopping in other nations just for the services that we need here in, in, in our country. Um, and I heard someone mention that we had to go to China for masses. You know, we should be producing those here, right here in our, in our nation here. So my thing is, there's a lot of work for us to do. Um, I feel the momentum of getting this uh, NIB up and running, this infrastructure bill. Uh, matter of fact, myself along with Lemon, uh, and I saw him on the line there, he was on the line there, but myself along with Lemon had went to uh, Representative Davis and, and kind of scroke him and scroke Congress and other members of Congress to get on board with this. And we need, we need bipartisanship. We cannot do this alone. We need bipartisanship and we need everyone on the line to continue to, to work their congressmen, work their senators, and to kind of get them on board. Because this would benefit our nation, this would benefit generations to come, and not so much for us, for, for us now, but the work we do can, can bless the generation that is behind us. Just like the generation before us blessed us with the infrastructure that we're using today. Um, here in South Carolina, we've been having some major issues here uh, in South Carolina as it deals with infrastructure, water. Certainly we know that climate, there's something going on with the climate which caused us to have the, the water that we're having, having the rainfall that we're having and having the storm. We've been having more storms here than anything. So it's here to stay. And I just think that we as a nation got to get ready for it. We got to prepare ourselves for it. And we need to do the necessary things in order to help alleviate some of the issues that we're dealing with. But with this infrastructure bank, we can put a lot of folks to work. With this infrastructure bank, we can, we can uh, create some new economies in new communities. Uh, with this infrastructure bank, we can, you know, in the country parts of our nation, you know, we can give those folks um, an opportunity to make money uh, for the farmers. Matter of fact, the farmers can use this uh, broadband. You know, there are churches that live in, in rural areas that, that can benefit from this broadband. So, so there, I don't know if he's trying to tell me something. But yeah, 10 more seconds if you would. It was, I want to say that this is a great thing. We hope that everyone really get, in, get on board. Thank you. Thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, next, I um, take particular pleasure uh, in introducing uh, a councilwoman from Allegheny County, uh, uh, which is about 60 miles from where uh, my home was for uh, many years until about two years ago um, when I moved here to Portland, Oregon. I'm very pleased and happy uh, to introduce to you uh, the sponsor of the resolution that was passed by the Allegheny Council recently, Councilwoman Anita Prizio. Anita, take it away. Greeting, greetings from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm a member of Allegheny County Council. It's an honor and a privilege to participate in this panel. Um, as, as, so, Go ahead. Uh, as part of the Appalachian region, we, along with neighboring states of West Virginia, Ohio, and Kentucky, face unique challenges in the midst of this pandemic and climate emergency. We need to rebuild Appalachia through investment in infrastructure, clean energy, and coal mine reclamation. We need to repair the damage done over the last century, modernize the electric grid, build sustainable, a sustainable transportation system, and ensure high quality, affordable broadband, particularly um, in the unserved rural areas. Such efforts um, would absolutely ensure genuine opportunities for this region's hardworking, resilient workforce. It is only through a national infrastructure band like HR 6422 can we really realize a just and sustainable economic transaction, transformation of the Appalachian region. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Anita. I just want to mention that in addition to Allegheny County, which is where Pittsburgh is located, that has passed this resolution, uh, the Pennsylvania Democratic State Committee has also done so. And in addition, there is legislation 
um, uh, that has been uh, proffered in the Pennsylvania State House and State Senate uh, supporting the creation of a national infrastructure bank. And uh, also, in addition to that outside of Pennsylvania, just this week, uh, the New York City Council has uh, had a, a, a new bill introduced, uh, a resolution that supports the creation of the National Infrastructure Bank. So as you can see, all over the country, in more, uh, in very prominent uh, locales and uh, uh, places where infrastructure is desperately needed, uh, this idea is garnering and gaining more and more support. Our next panelist up uh, is uh, Caroline Achille. And Caroline, you have the floor. Take it away. Thank you, Jack. My name is Caroline Achille, political coordinator for the International Union of Operating Engineers Local 501. We represent over 11,000 members in Southern California and Southern Nevada, and we support Bill HR 6422 and the National Infrastructure Bank. HR 6422 provides for independent funds dedicated to rebuilding infrastructure across America. Yesterday, Governor Newsom has announced his, by executive order his intent to phase out gas-fueled cars by 2035, thus ending the gas tax in California leaving California to scramble for new funding sources from state government funding already racked by recession, thus making sources like the Infrastructure Bank more important than ever. Projects in California funded with Infrastructure Bank monies or public monies have a mandated use of apprentices on their projects. These training programs provide increased knowledge in our workforce for generations to come, thereby investing in our future. Operating engineers operate training facilities that produce trained and ready workers that are knowledgeable with modernized concepts and technology. Building engineers, electricians, pipe fitters, transportation, highways, water systems, nurses, energy. Our policy is keeping America moving, and with HR 6422, we can do just that. I ask that you support us, join us in supporting HR 6422. Let's keep America moving together. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Next up, uh, we have a panelist from Dearborn, Michigan, and uh, who's an experienced politico and public servant, Lamar Lemons. Lamar, your turn. Okay, well, that's not, I'm not from Dearborn, Michigan. I am from Detroit, Michigan, the Motor City. So, <laughs> but Dearborn is in our uh, proximity. I am a, a chief of staff to uh, State Senator Betty Jean Alexander, and our entire office has been engaged in seeing that uh, House Bill 6422 is passed. Um, Representative uh, Robert Davis, of, uh, Robert Williams of South Carolina and I were instrumental in securing um, the Congressman Danny Davis sponsorship, and we had to go back to the drawing board and work and um, redraft the legislation that eventually became um, uh, 6422. And once we were able to rope in a sponsor, we were able to rope in another sponsor. Well, I'm here to report that uh, from the state of Michigan, uh, a Congresswoman Debbie Dingell has joined as a uh, co-sponsor to this legislation. So we are working our congressional delegation as well as uh, the municipalities um, through, uh, and other institutions throughout of the state. We have the city of Hamtramck, the city of Ecorse, the city of Inkster, the city of Dearborn Heights, the city of Redford, all have adopted resolutions in support. There, we are pending uh, legislation with um, 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 uh, other municipalities, and I'm looking them up, and uh, let me say this, that our staffer, uh, Lisa Hicks Clayton, has been instrumental um, in assisting to do that. She is also a, uh, a city council person from the city of Dearborn Heights, as, as well as uh, Legina Washington, who is a city council person from uh, uh, the city of Inkster, and she is also part of our staff here um, for State Senator Betty Jean Alexander. 
I am the former president of the Detroit Public School Board, and we cannot, our state cannot afford, nor can the city afford to build the infrastructure needed, no, nor can we uh, put together the financing to do so. It is imperative for us to fix our old and decaying school buildings uh, and to also build new 21st century school buildings that this House Bill 6422 passed. It is imperative that this is the only mechanism that I see that can possibly work in terms of all the problems that we have with infrastructure in the state of Michigan and the entire United States. Additionally, we have uh, the uh, issue with uh, our water infrastructure. And as someone pointed out, we too have logs, uh, 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 tree logs and wooden uh, sewer as part of our sewer system um, for the city of Detroit. Our old and decaying sewer system, our, our lead line sewer system, um, all has caused uh, health problems. And so this is a way and the only way that I see uh, that we can finance and employ and rebuild America, in particular, the urban areas. Thank you very much, Lamar. Greatly appreciate it. And uh, my due respect to the city of Detroit. Uh, next, we're going to go uh, to a United Auto Worker uh, president lo of Local 50 uh, from Ohio, I believe, Bob Lynn. Bob, you're up. Actually, I'm not uh, UAW. I'm actually UA Plumbers and Pipefitters, United Association. And I'm retired now. I'm a union organizer, uh, retired union organizer. And I currently am acting as the uh, <coughs> labor uh, coordinator for the National Infrastructure Bank. Uh, one of the things that I think is most important that we need to remember about why we need a National Infrastructure Bank. It's really simple. Right now, the appropriations or pay-as-you-go system that we currently operate under really is a political football in so many ways. It allows one side, whichever one comes into power, uh, whatever election happens, to be able to go and rearrange the deck chairs to be able to do it. We don't have a national strategy to be able to address the national infrastructure needs of this country. The National Infrastructure Bank would be the financing necessary to be able to finally fix our infrastructure. Our infrastructure uh, is vastly deteriorating. Right now, China spends about 8% of their GDP on infrastructure. <clears throat> Europe spends 5.5% of their GDP on infrastructure. And in the United States, we spend about 2.5% uh, of our GDP. With that kind of a uh, failing on our part, we are falling farther and farther behind. That way, if we do not address these things, uh, we will continue to have Flint, Michigan's, where you have water situations that are, are very tragic. The dams that just uh, happened up there in, in Michigan were allowed a whole lake to drain and, and flood out a whole community. Um, bridges falling uh, like they did in Minnesota. Uh, we are just one tragedy away from having catastrophe happen. And this is a, our opportunity to really be able to rearrange how we and address how we uh, do infrastructure in this country. We need to have the investment, much like they did in the Great Depression when FDR did it, that created the TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, allowed uh, rural electrification. We need that kind of a program if we're going to actually solve and address the issues that are so imperative to be able to make sure that America continues to, to lead and be the uh, number one nation in the world. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, last, but certainly not least, very happy to introduce to you our panelists from the Ohio State House of Representatives, Representative Lisa Sobecki. Uh, Lisa, you're next. Thank you all for um, giving me this opportunity and to be around so many amazing folks this evening. I couldn't see myself spending any other time but being here. Um, it's my pleasure 
um, to serve the 120,000 plus constituents across my district. And my district is in Toledo, as was said, I'm kind of on the border. I, I, I say I'm kind of the garter of the football when we have that one football game a year um, against um, that state right above me. Um, but regardless though, um, I was happy to co-sponsor with Representative Skindell, excuse me, yes, co-sponsor House uh, Resolution 348 in the Ohio House. I'm a freshman um, legislator this year, but I'm not a freshman at understanding the importance on our infrastructure and the important needs to fix, and, and I have to disagree with my colleague over there, good friend Bob Lynn, um, on the catastrophe waiting to happen. I say the catastrophe is already here. Uh, because I've actually witnessed through the COVID-19, the catastrophe of the inability for kids to be able to connect, to um, do their schoolwork as schools have been um, currently in the remote situation. But our educators have uh, put together um, plans to be able to get them um, some um, connectability, but that's still not acceptable. We should not be sitting in this time, day and age, not having broadband accessibility to all of our students and all of our families across the United States. But I, when I moved to Toledo, uh, after I came out of the United States Navy as a first firefighter instructor there, I noticed that uh, when I moved um, out of South Carolina up here into Toledo, there was, a, there was conversation here 25 years ago about the need for high-speed rail and here we are 25 years later still not doing this. This is like a political football game that we continue to have. And we need to start making action. And by having the, the National Infrastructure Bank in place, we can stop making this a political football that's like a football game that we have against Ohio State and Michigan each and every year. And we need to get this job done right here and right now at this time because we need to block off this um, tsunami that has been wiping across our United States. Our bridges are failing, our um, buildings are crumbling, and now is the time that we be able to provide safe lines of water to our families to the north of me in Flint, Michigan. The time is now because it's not just Flint. In Toledo, we have lead pipe, pipe problems as well. And not one child should go to school with lead pipes that are bleeding into their school systems and hurting our babies each and every day. So with that, I thank you all very much for the opportunity and um, look forward to continue to work beside and do my part as a freshman legislator, but not a freshman at this conversation moving forward. And thank you all for, the, um, for this opportunity. Thank you, Representative. And again, uh, we will have our panelists give closing comments uh, at the end of the webinar. But in the meantime, we're now going to go to the question and answer session. And I'm going to start with uh, the very first question that was asked by Del Lear. Um, who uh, asked the question before we even started our uh, webinar. Um, he asked, uh, is the National Infrastructure Bank part of the Democrat, uh, Democratic Party and Biden's campaign platform? And in answer to your question, uh, Dale, yes. First of all, let me explain that the Infrastructure Bank was mentioned briefly in the initial draft of the Democratic Party platform in July, and then was sent out to um, uh, the delegates for and Democratic Party members for a consideration and review. Uh, we, as part of the coalition, lobbied uh, the party and the Biden campaign to expand references with regard to infrastructure development and include a reference to a national infrastructure bank. So there is reference within the platform. Um, I believe it's uh, on page 17, if I'm not mistaken, if you would wish to go there and it will be cited. Uh, second of all, uh, with regard to what's happening now uh, con concerning references uh, to the National Infrastructure Bank na uh, uh, with regard to the Biden campaign, we are in contact uh, in many, several different ways. Uh, with regard to the Biden staff and uh, its um, economic uh, transition uh, staff, uh, urging them 
uh, to look more and more carefully with regard to the use of a national infrastructure bank. And one of the most unique and, and greatest assets of it, as Alfeca was explaining earlier, we will be able to have these funds used for development of our infrastructure bank without creating debt. And that is a huge uh, impediment that has stifled economic development in this country since the 1960s. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, as a result, we have a huge backlog of, of things that need be done. Uh, next, let me go to... Um, Jack? Uh, go, yes. If I may, I, so I also serve on, this is Lou De Palma from Rhode Island. I also serve on the policy committee for the Biden campaign specifically infrastructure, specifically funding and stimulus, and it's been discussed, or it's being discussed. Great, thank you very much, Lou. And let me also make mention that, yes, there is a reference uh, to $4 trillion uh, 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 of investments uh, by the Biden campaign, uh, but again, this is not a, 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 a policy that uh, avoids debt, it creates it, and, uh, and, and as a result, that impedes its consideration going forward. Um, our next question from Marilyn Chase. Uh, the infrastructure bank of the 30s and the 40s provided credit to numerous economic sectors, including manufacturing of all types of products, not just infrastructure. Will we be able to extend credit or other investment mechanisms to other economic sectors? I'm going to toss this question over to Alfeca, and Alfeca, um, your turn to respond to this particular question, if you would. So the first emphasis of the NIB, of course, is to build the infrastructure. And we think by building the infrastructure that this will go a long way towards stimulating manufacturing indirectly. However, if there are certain sectors where we can make an economic public good case for uh, involving ourselves directly in manufacturing, for example, if a, an auto plant closes down in some place in the Rust Belt, in the um, Midwest Rust Belt, uh, there, and then a lot of folks are made unemployed by that, there is clearly a public good uh, re rationale for the NIB to uh, buy or purchase the uh, plant and uh, convert it into an infant industry, for example, to manufacture wind turbines or manufacture rail cars for subway systems. And those kinds of things, those kinds of projects definitely will be on the, uh, the, the, the vision of the NIB going forward. Excuse Jack, me, uh, um, the, I muted myself. Um, our next question from Tom Galloway. Uh, is the Southeast Michigan Council of Governments uh, going to sign on? Uh, anyone from uh, Michigan uh, wish to answer that? All right, uh, next question. Uh, Republicans and conservatives would love uh, infrastructure investment because they know the Trump administration has done little on a national level. A national infrastructure bank is low hanging fruit. Uh, why isn't Biden and Dems presenting it aggressively to voters? Um, I will answer that uh, and say uh, they are focusing on issues uh, that are broad and general in themes and uh, not as specific yet with regard to this issue. Uh, this uh, uh, policy is still in play and it is being advocated for and is garnering more and more support from the grassroots as reflected by the resolutions that we are having passed uh, by uh, unions and uh, elected officials all throughout the country. Uh, we view this policy as something that is a grassroots effort and we are pushing it up uh, uh, the ladder and uh, uh, into the political campaigns of not only Biden, uh, but also 
uh, uh, representatives and, and senators throughout the country. So uh, uh, we are moving this thing forward and the more support that we get from the public, the stronger our impact is going to be to implement the, the policy itself. Yeah. I'm next. Yeah. Could I, I just want to check as well because, um, you know, it's time for, uh, and grassroots, you know, we need to make our voice known. Uh, for so long, we've been uh, hearing from our, our legislators and they're telling us what to do. But we need to tell, we need to send the message back to them. We need to let them know that what we want as, 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 as a nation, instead of having our legislators uh, from Washington and from our state telling us, uh, the people, uh, what is needed. Thanks very much. Um, and Lamar, uh, might you be able to address the question with regard to uh, the Michigan effort? Uh, absolutely. Uh, the uh, Southeast Council, Council of, of Government uh, has the, uh, the uh, proposal before them, and they are uh, looking at it to, for their consideration to support it. Um, we're waiting to, for their response. Great, thank you so much, Lamar. Uh, next, I will come back to some of the, uh, the Q&A uh, questions that are posted on uh, the website, but I wanna go to uh, uh, a general question uh, to uh, uh, some of our panelists. Uh, every part of the nation has immediate and long-term needs for infrastructure construction, from fixing roads to building water systems. Please address this issue in your area and the nation and how a national infrastructure bank would help. And I'm going to first start uh, having Lou respond to this, uh, then Joe Cerisi, then uh, Carolyn, and then Lisa. Uh, Joe, you can go first, thank you. Sorry, I was on a campaign call. <laughs> um, Sarah, let me hang out with you. All right, that was one of my staffers. Um, this, we're wrapping this up now already? Uh, no, I wanted to, to ask you a question uh, that I'll come back to uh, in just a moment. Uh, 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 every part of the nation has an immediate and long-term need for infrastructure construction, from fixing roads to building water systems. Please address this issue in your area and the nation and how a national infrastructure bank would help. Thank you. So as I brought up before, my specific area has an issue with um, transportation. Our highways were never made to take the roads, the, the amount of cars they have, and there is no public transportation in my area. But throughout the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, we have one of the oldest infrastructures in the nation. Uh, in our cities, both Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, where they need help, um, we're seeing the cities come back to us and asking for money and our municipalities for different projects. Um, I happen to have in my district a nuclear power plant, and nuclear energy is a great renewable resource for energy. But we have something happening in Pennsylvania with the pipelines because we have one of the largest settlements of natural gas. Um, and even with that, we need infrastructure. We need all new water lines, all new uh, grid lines, everything that goes on with the, the state and our communities. And this is important because we don't have the money. We have a $5.5 billion deficit right now. As my colleagues from around the nation, I'm sure are experiencing the same thing through this pandemic. And we need to make good jobs, high paying jobs. And that's what I think that this bank will do to help us. And like I stated before, Pennsylvania is among some of the worst bridges in the United States. I was thrilled to hear Thomas talk about the bridge in New York. I remember as a kid going over the, uh, what was that, the Tappan Zee it replaced? I've yet to go over the Mario Cuomo and I'm looking forward to it. But the last time I went over the Tappan Zee and seeing them build the Mario Cuomo, I thought, oh boy, I'm on this bridge and they're building that bridge. Thank but tomorrow you. I'll be going over all your all the new bridges as I head back to Long Island for the night. So the new Gothels, the new uh, Kosciuszko. Um, but that's what we're looking for in Pennsylvania, to be able to do what they did in New York. So thank thanks, everyone. Well, I'll get all off right. quickly so you can get somebody else's opinion. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Carolyn, your turn. having issues unmuting, sorry, thank you very much. Um, as I stated earlier, uh, our, our governor, you know, announced his executive order um, to phase out the gas fuel cars by 2035. And 
we here were relying on that with funds for the SB1 to fix our roads and our bridges. Um, if you've ever driven up the five or anything like that, you know, I mean, there's constant construction, but our roads are just crazy. Our bridges need to be repaired. We have earthquakes like summer barbecues and fires out here. Um, so we desperately do need uh, funding. Our, our current funds that we have now just can't meet the demands. So this right here would help us immensely. Thank you. Great, and thank you. And uh, Lisa, you're up next. And if we could keep uh, these responses uh, for the questions that I answer, uh, 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 ask myself uh, to 30 seconds. Lisa, your turn. I'll try to keep it there, Jack. Um, I would say our biggest um, concerns really kind of, it's really hard to just identify one, but I would say the top three would, would be that we need to do the infrastructure for our roads. We recently uh, had to pass a gas tax here. Um, in the state of Ohio, not, um, not uh, something that everyone wants to pay. And our broadband, we definitely need to have that in our lead pipes throughout our state. So those three areas are the top three that I would say that the, the National Infrastructure Bank would be able to help, but also keeping those good paying jobs. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, our next lightning round question is, there is now a decided turn toward building and financing railroads and mass transit in the nation. Everything from passenger to high speed to commuter. Please comment on how a switch to rail type mass transportation would impact your area. And I'm gonna ask this question uh, for 30 second responses to first Jason, then Ryan, then Anita, and then Erica. Uh, Jason. Well, in Virginia, we, we suffer the second worst um, uh, traffic jam with, when you come to D.C. in that area in Northern Virginia. So that would alleviate some of the pressure there. But, you know, another item is we have a huge offshore wind interest now. And a big component of that is rail. I know that's not transportation, but that is a supply chain item for offshore wind in the renewable world and space. So we would very much need some upgrades on, on both sides of the cargo rail and on the passenger rail. Thank you, Jason. Ryan, your turn. Immediately uh, uh, adding passenger would uh, alleviate the traffic on the freeways and the roads. Um, the more traffic we have on the roads, obviously, the more wear and tear on the roads. Uh, we also, you know, our freight rail in California is, is very lacking. We have bridges left over from almost the Civil War that, that need to be refurbished and corrected and, and even rebuilt. Um, so uh, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the word. Getting getting everything on the rail off the roads would make uh, make our lives much easier with traffic and uh, the wear and tear on the uh, the infrastructure of the highways. Great, thank you, Ryan. Uh, Anita, you're up. I agree with what everyone said. In Western Pennsylvania, we don't have a lot of rail at all. Um, even a simple rail going from the city into the airport would be wonderful. So um, it would be great to have some rail. I, I know we tried it, it you know, the, the money isn't there and just to have something like that would be amazing. I'd love to see it and that would be perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Uh, Erica, your comments. I know this may come as a shocker, but Toledo historically for Amtrak was the busiest station in the state of Ohio. So when Amtrak came in and cut our rail here in Toledo, that was very devastating, not only for jobs, but also for the infrastructure where we were able to do here in the city of Toledo, which connected us back to Northeast Ohio, Detroit, Chicago. So by just bringing in high speed rail, you allow the connectivity to Northwest Ohio and what you have to understand geographically with Toledo is we're over here by ourselves. Again, <laughs> the closest, we're the fourth largest city, but we're much closer geographically to, to Detroit than we are any other city in the state of Ohio. We need high-speed rail. We use that in our area and it would also not only connect people to jobs, but also education and continue to grow this area both directly with jobs directly and indirectly. So we really want to see that. And again, Toledo, the highest user, our, our station here in Ohio. So it's a demand here in Toledo. Thank you, Erica. 
Our next question is, the nation is facing a mass unemployment uh, circumstance, social unrest, and increasing rates of mental distress. How would a national infrastructure bank and mass employment and training address the crisis in the nation? Uh, first, we're going to have uh, Tom speak, then Bob Lynn, then Robert Williams, and Lamar. Tom, your turn. Thank you, Jack. You know, I think it's imperative. Uh, jobs create a good economy, right? So when there's unemployment in, in a community, I know for myself, when I used to get laid off, I live in a small community. Uh, I could be working 26 months straight in a row. I'm laid off for three days. I go to the post office and, you know, my neighbors are going, oh, you're out of work. I felt horrible, you know. So it's, it, it kind of creates a little bit of a depression being out of work. So the economy, with the economy moving, it just gets everybody up and going. You know, uh, FDR thought about it back in the day, right? What's going to get this country out of this mess? Get jobs, get people working. You start feeling better about yourself. And it, it, it's an upward domino effect. It just creates a, a positive energy for everybody. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Tom, you're up next. No, no I'm sorry, Bob. Uh, thank you. Uh, one of the things that uh, is really important whenever it comes to uh, doing infrastructure, we're talking about creating 25 million jobs. Right now, uh, the depressions that uh, people are suffering from uh, with uh, being locked up in their houses, depending on what's going on, etc., uh, that's really had a, a devastating effect on the restaurant and the, the bar scene and, and all the rest of that. But it's also affected an awful lot of people uh, that go to work every day. Construction, uh, for the most part, has been able to go uh, and, and somewhat plateau and be able to, to carry on. But there are certain areas in the country where the construction uh, trades really have fallen down. And the, the amount of money that could get uh, out there on the projects that need to get done, that could help to be able to help people be able to... Uh, uh, put food on the table, take some of that worry off, uh, that at the end of the day, I think that's one of the best things that could happen with the National Infrastructure Bank. Thank you. Uh, I agree with that, Bob. Uh, Robert, uh, you're up next. Yeah, well, all I got to say is uh, when, when we give people jobs, we give people ability to, to, uh, to feel worth something. You know, not only not only just giving them jobs, but we got to give them a livable wage job. You know, for so long, many folks who are probably out of work are, are, are working at these minimal jobs. But we have to give them something to sustain their entire family so that they can uh, really enjoy having. And but jobs that that would really give them uh, uh, worth it is worth their time. Great. Thank you very much. Lamar. Uh, yes, there's nothing, uh, uh, the late Coleman Alexander Young, the former mayor of the city of Detroit, used to say, there's nothing to help the that can help the crime rate better than a good paying job. I grew up in the city of Detroit when the home of the original middle class, the home of the auto industry, the home of the UAW, and good paying, good paying jobs uh, created the middle class. It, uh, created a beautiful, thriving city called Detroit at the time, at that time called the Paris of the Midwest. Uh, it was a, a beautiful city. Um, most people in the city had jobs that could pay uh, a, a, a wage that you could take, one person could take right. care of a, a family. That's right. And uh, with, a, with a good paying job. And so, uh, the, the return, this is an opportunity to return to such times and even improve it. And these jobs cannot be farmed overseas. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lamar. Uh, our next question, and this is something that just recently happened. Outside of Washington, D.C., a $16 billion project to build a new subway line has just closed down partway through the project. The line is being financed by a public-private partnership, PPP. The contractors have just walked away and the project is being closed due to quote unquote, cost overruns, delays and disagreements between the PPP and the state, unquote. This has happened in many places. If 
enacted, the National Infrastructure Bank would partner with the state of Maryland and the counties involved to finance the project. We would like to have our panelists comment on that. And we're gonna start off with Jason, then go to Ryan, Anita, and Erica. Jason. Jack, are we talking about the Silver Line going into DC? Yep. Yeah, well, the first phase of that was done under a project labor agreement. And then Barbara Constock from here and the rest of them got rid of the project labor agreement in the second half of that. And it has been nothing but a disaster. And that was so that we put in $380 million plus from the state of Virginia. Um, that would be where you would have something in there where you have that actual prevailing wage. You would bring better contractors to the project. You would bring better uh, uh, logistics to the project. And that's what happens when you try to get bottom dollar on a very complex and very expensive project. Thank you, Jason. Ryan. I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the question. I was uh, uh, answering one of my union members. Uh, that's all right. Uh, we'll come back to you a little bit later. Um, Anita. Um, I'm not that familiar with what's going on in DC, but I would imagine that had a, we had an infrastructure bank, something like this would not be happening and we wouldn't have these kind of um, issues with the different entities that are involved in the project. So I think um, that would be the way to go. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, Lisa, uh, let, let us have you uh, speak to this question if you would like. Well, really, I just need to echo what Jason said, because when you have low paying jobs for a big scale job, you're going to have these issues. And through having project labor agreements, um, you have skilled workforce on the job that's being able to identify and be able to um, to um, rectify the situation. So, um, you know, when we do good planning and we have good paying jobs that provide good good wages, good health care, good opportunities for men and women, you're going to have a good quality product. You're not going to have them walking off halfway through the job. Great. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, we're going to have a question uh, directed to uh, Senator De Palma. Uh, there is momentum behind a national infrastructure bank as well as a national climate bank that will invest in clean energy and transportation infrastructure. Should we be looking to create an all-purpose infrastructure financing entity that is a one-stop shop, similar uh, to the IR infrastructure bank from uh, uh, the uh, FDR administration in the Depression that was referred to by Senator DePaul? Uh, Lou, do you want to take a shot at that? And then we'll pass that uh, question also off to Alfetta. Uh, Jack, yes. And I want to thank... Uh... I think I saw the question in there from Jeff Deal. Jeff is in fact the executive director of the Rhode Island Infrastructure Bank. That's the RIIB in there. So Jeff, thank you for being on the line. Uh, great work that Jeff does with the Rhode Island Infrastructure Bank. I think there shouldn't be any reason we couldn't see how to bring the two of those together. Uh, it would be the right thing to do. Infrastructure projects that are gonna move forward in this next decade or that are be beginning now and will move forward beginning next year are gonna be climate. Uh, address the climate change, the climate resilient uh, projects. To do anything less would be irresponsible not to do that. So I do see them coming together and we should see how to figure out and get some synergy between them. But infrastructure projects by their very nature moving forward need to be able to address the uh, uh, climate and be climate resilient. Alfeca. So we uh, early on, uh, I uh, asked ourselves the same question too, um, especially when uh, Ocasio-Cortez came out with her Green New Deal outline. Uh, and we asked ourselves the question, what was the overlap between the NIB and that version of the Green New Deal and concluded that there was almost an, a, a total overlap. The NIB covers all of the questions on clean water, clean air, climate resiliency, all those kind of things that the Green New Deal wants to address. Um, the emphasis is a little uh, different. Uh, our, our bigger 
our bigger emphasis is we want to solve the traffic problem. And that's because the largest emitter now of CO2 is traffic. It's, it's actually uh, surpassed electricity generation. The only thing that the NIB would not cover is moving electric generators off of fossil fuels. And we really need to have more of a discussion with the, with the Green New Deal people on this because uh, uh, there are different formulations for how to do it. For example, is the best way to apply a carbon tax and then use the revenues uh, to fix the budget. And uh, at the same time, um, there'll be um, private owners of generators will move off of fossil fuels voluntarily. That's already happening, by the way. Uh, so th th those things are still up for discussion, but we, there is very strong overlap and our bank uh, has uh, provisions in it to make sure that we're using green materials, uh, the latest technologies uh, to um, reduce um, uh, climate change effects um, in, in the bank. Thank you, Alpeka. And uh, there's uh, one or two other questions I'm going to toss your way here. Um, coastal resilience is essential to prepare and protect from rising seas, hurricanes, massive flooding along America's coastlines. Can the Atlantic and Gulf states work together using the National Infrastructure Bank as a regional strategic imperative? Uh, the answer to that is definitely yes. Um, that's because the, um, the American Society of Civil Engineers already has on its books to look at water management uh, and to build uh, resiliency into infrastructure. Uh, so uh, as, as a matter of course, when we're re replacing electricity grids, we'll want to be putting them underground. Uh, when we're building uh, dams, uh, 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 for example, the, the port of uh, Galveston, uh, has quite a few projects on the books. I think that they're all, almost shovel ready, ready to go. They have no money to pay for them to protect Galveston Port and the oil refineries in Houston um, from rising waters or storms that come in and fill the whole area up with water. So all of these projects absolutely can be done with the National Infrastructure Bank. Great, and another question for you, Alfeca. Uh, trains, dams, et cetera, can generate fees in order to pay back the loan uh, to the National Infrastructure Bank. But what about other projects? Where would the money come uh, to pay back the funds? So the idea of the bank is uh, that we're funding public infrastructure and uh, we're willing to work with P3s, public-private partnerships uh, when uh, uh, a project would warrant that, like refurbishing an airport, for example. Uh, but, but if that if there's infrastructure that's in the public hands and is not currently subject to tolls or, uh, uh, or and that could include also things like public school systems, uh, we want to keep those in public hands because we view that they're public goods. So we, we pro offer the most flexible financing options available to state and local governments to finance their infrastructure. And that includes that they can either pay out of user fees uh, or they can uh, uh, create an authority like a train authority uh, to, um, to be uh, an independent entity that collects the user fees or, uh, um, and will take the loans, or we can just uh, direct, let, lend directly to the authority that owns the infrastructure and they can pay us back out of their general revenues. And we think that this will really, even if they're in financial difficulty now, and a, a lot of uh, state and local governments are as a result of the coronavirus, we think this is the fastest way to get them out of their financial difficulty because the faster we get all the people off of unemployment and into great, great paying jobs, they'll be uh, paying income taxes and replenishing state and local coffers to repay back loans. Great, thank you, Alfeca. Uh, Bob, I'm going to uh, flip the um, uh, stage over to you and ask uh, for you to make any comments with regard to that question and just generally an infrastructure bank and its benefits. Well, uh, when it comes to the infrastructure bank, uh, some of the benefits that uh, Alfeca really talked about uh, are imperative here. Um, we uh, need to make sure that uh, when we're investing, uh, that that money that <clears throat> will get generated from taxes. Uh, every dollar that gets spent on infrastructure turns over in a community anywhere from three to seven times. Now, what does that mean? That means once the, the workers get paid, they go and they go to the, they go to restaurants, they go to grocery stores, they go to all those types of things. That there starts to generate 
uh, the economy, gets the economy going, et cetera. And once that happens, then the tax, uh, taxes start to come in and then uh, communities have the ability to be able to repay uh, those types of things, whether or not, uh, uh, whether or not they actually have user fees. The, the thing is, what we have to keep in mind here is some infrastructure is so vital whether we pay for it uh, with taxes or whether we pay for it, uh, ju we just have to have it. I mean, think about it. Fresh water. You have to have fresh water to be able to be able to, to do that. You have to have a sewer, a wastewater treatment plant uh, to be able to, to address the sewers and, and the, the actions actually that go on in a community. Those things all have to get uh, done in order for us to be able to function. And uh, those uh, things we are gonna to have to pay for them one way or another. And this is definitely an opportunity to be able to do that. The last thing I'd say is that every time we've done a National Infrastructure Bank, the four times in our past history, they never thought they'd ever uh, end uh, with a profit. And what happened is every time they ended in the black, they all were, uh, none of them wound up being something that was not paid for. At the end of the day, they actually generated and created the amount of economic productivity that this country needs. Uh, Lou, I'm gonna let you take a shot at that uh, uh, issue also. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I'm not sure that I have much more than what uh, uh, Bob has said to uh, repeat. So I would just, I would ditto what Bob had said. So. Okay, great, thank comment. you very much. All right, uh, next. Uh, I think we're going to move to the uh, closing statements. Uh, and I would ask that each of our panelists uh, give about a one minute uh, in duration response. And uh, we um, will go in reverse order this time. And I'm going to start off first with uh, Representative Lisa Sobecki. Uh, Lisa, your one minute closing statement. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jack. I'm just going to make this really short um, as the hour is getting late. But really, I think this is a, a, a great conversation that we need to continue to have and continue that grassroots movement to get this infrastructure um, bank opportunity um, out to our citizens within our states. Because this is greatly important, as we've all mentioned earlier before, that we need to revitalize our infrastructure and be able to put so many hardworking, good paying, good benefits, jobs on our market today. And this can be done very, very easily. And so I'm really excited for um, the opportunity to be here with everyone, but I'm even more excited to be able to um, watch that swearing in ceremony for President Biden when January 20th comes along, because I know that then our America is going to be saved for the jobs, for the hardworking men and women that serve our unions today and work those jobs. That's why we were built in America. So I'm looking forward to um, having, the, again, this opportunity to speak with everybody and get you um, you're breaking up, uh, Lisa. Oh, this pathway. Uh, uh, I think we have a bad connection or you're buffering. So thank you very much, Lisa. Growth oh, grassroots movement to build us. Okay. Well, I'll just close it. It's my dedication to work on both sides of our aisles and the um, Ohio State House to um, get our resolution passed and continue to have conversations within our communities. Thank you. Great, Lisa. Thank you. Uh, Bob, you're next. Thank you. <clears throat> well, one of the things, uh, if you've ever been on any of our phone calls, et cetera, one of the things that I always like to emphasize is that it takes a small group of people at the end of the day to be able to make things make things happen. And everyone who's on this webinar, the panelists and you who are out there watching it, you're that small group, group of people who really have the ability to be able to make uh, HR 6422 a reality. What you need to do is find out exactly what it is about the bill that you like. And there's plenty to like. Find out what it is 
and talk to the people up and down the food chain that you're involved in. You're involved in an organization one way or another. It could be the vets, it could be uh, city uh, government, it could be whatever. Whatever that is, find out what uh, is important to you and try to make sure it's important to them. Because at the end of the day, we have to build a parade. Because if we build the parade, I guarantee you, once the parade's built, the politicians will run to the front and they'll pull us across the line and this will happen. But it will only happen if we actually all do our small little part. I'm not asking you to do everything. I'm asking you to do your small little part. Well put, Bob. I can't agree with you more. Uh, Lamar, uh, you're next. Uh, take it away. Well, I would like to say that it is imperative that we get this legislation passed. We're working diligently here in Michigan. We've been able to secure um, multiple city councils. We've secured, we lassoed our first congressperson. We have uh, a total of 14 in Michigan, and we're going to lasso the other 13 in a bipartisan fashion because we it, we must move this legislation um, forward. Um, House Bill 6422. Again, that's House Bill, House Resolution 6422. So I would uh, employ all of the listening audience to call your Congress people, to call your state legislator. Uh, uh, Senator Betty Jean Alexander has a, a resolution in support of House Bill 6422. Call your legislature, ask them to move the legislation forward. Call your congressperson, call your city council people. If your city hasn't adopted a resolution, have them do so. And you'll be able to call, again, our office, and you'll be able to talk to, and most likely you'll be talking to Lisa Hicks Clayton from our office, um, or someone from our office who will uh, assist you, and you can, we're willing to work with you to see that this vital legislation is passed. Thank you. Thank you, Lamar. Excellent suggestion and strategy. Uh, Caroline, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, perhaps a mute. Uh, we'll come back to Caroline then. Uh, next, let's go to uh, Anita Prizio. Anita, uh, your closing one minute statement. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much. I learned so much during this, um, this panel and thank you for having me. Um, it's definitely an idea whose time has come and I'm willing to do whatever I can to you know, work on this bill, pass it. And as Bob had said, it's important to tell my fellow council members about the bill and focus on what's the most important thing about the bill. But this is going to ensure a better future for my children and my grandchildren and everyone's children. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Let me just comment and say, as Lamar just suggested, Anita took the bull by the horn, so to speak, and on her own, uh, 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 pushed through and proffered uh, the resolution for the Allegheny County Council uh, with heart, no direction from us. So uh, that's the kind of action and leadership that we'd like to see in our country and, and support the National Infrastructure Bank. Uh, our next uh, uh, speaker will be uh, Robert Williams for his closing statement. Uh, Robert, your turn. Thank you. Uh, we may have an issue there with Robert also. So can you hear me? There we are. Here, okay. Yes, we thank thank you ahead. so much. Well, I just want to I just want to start out by thanking all the panelists for being on call tonight. I just want to warn that people with no hope are people that don't vote are people with no hope. I just want to make sure that we all get out there and vote so that we can create hope for 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 the future. Um, this is a very important task that we're on. I believe that if we continue to work together, we continue to collaborate, and we continue to do the things that is necessary, we can overcome any obstacle. Um, so I just want to encourage us to work together and let, and let us as, um, as, as individuals do our part. You know, we cannot sit on our hands on this. We got to continue to work 
and make a difference in the lives of uh, our family, in the lives of the other citizens that certainly are in great, great need of infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, we're going to flip back to Caroline, who um, got disconnected from our webinar, but is on the phone. So, uh, Caroline, uh, your turn to give your closing statement, and we're glad to have you back. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, this is definitely, again, right here was proof of the need for uh, infrastructure. I just want to thank everyone for participating um, and reiterate what already has been said. Please contact your elected officials at every level. Ask that they support H.R. 6422. We need to ensure that we all keep America moving. And with this, we can. Thank you very much. You're very welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, next, our closing statement from Thomas Carey. Tom. I, uh, once again, I just want to thank all the panelists. Uh, I'm very honored to serve with everybody on this, on this panel. This is a movement that we're going to look back one day and say, thank God that we were part of this movement. And I saw over 89 uh, participants on this webinar this evening. So if every one of you talks to somebody, an elected official, a friend, you know, if you can feel the excitement in the room, you listen to some of the panelists, this is a very exciting time right now. We need HR 6422 now more than ever. Uh, with our crumbling infrastructure, I have a nuclear power plant in my backyard that is shutting down after 50 years of service. And a company just came in recently and they wanna build offshore wind. They wanna do manufacturing and fabrication for offshore wind uh, tunnels. And the blades themselves are 365 feet long. Uh, one of the problems they're up against right now is they need money. So if this HR 6422 had passed six months ago, these guys would be in good shape to get the money. This is a $400 million project that would help all the workers that are going to lose their jobs with the closure of Indian Point, Unit 2 and 3. So feel the excitement, be part of it, be part of this movement, and talk to all your local representatives, your elected officials. And once again, I thank everybody, all the panelists, and all the elected officials from Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, Virginia. Thank you very much. And thank you, Tom. Next, uh, Pennsylvania Representative Joseph Cerisi. Uh, Joe, you're up. Well, thank you very much. And again, I want to reiterate what I said before, that it's an honor to be on this panel. It's an honor to think that we can make a true change in the United States that will last for, the, the, for a very long time. Um, this is a very exciting movement, and I look forward to being a loud voice in the Pennsylvania legislature to get my colleagues on board with this, to make sure that we can move this with our Congress people, our senators, and see this come to fruition. Um, to make sure that we are able to, to, to see these jobs and see these projects get done. So I look forward to more conversations on this and thank you again. Thank you, Joe, for your leadership and we very much value it. Uh, next, um, Erica White, uh, uh, you have the stage. Um, please proceed with your closing statement. Hello, everyone. So I'm going to talk directly to my union family, if you don't mind. Uh, I know a lot of them are on tonight. And the one thing we do well, better than anyone else, is we can organize, mobilize, and we can endorse. So when it comes to HR 6422, the reason why we have so many reps on, like from my own area, uh, Lisa Sobecki, who is one of uh, the co-sponsors of the bill here in Ohio, the reason why that, that is happening is because we're reaching out and we're talking and we're also endorsing. Our local union has endorsed HR 6422. So you can do that also stepping out. This is a grassroots movement. And for us, we get that as union members. So we have to do what we do best. As Representative Davis said, we need to get the economy moving. We don't need to forget also that this is not going to, when we talk about 25 million jobs, that's just direct jobs. We're not even talking about indirect jobs that will be created. As my brother from UAW here in uh, Local 14 keeps saying, hey, if we get high-speed rail, we can get electric cars, right? So there is a lot of excitement that is going around this bill what's in it to be excited about and what is going to happen indirectly. So if you want to be a part of this, and we're excited to have you reach out to any of us, especially Bob Lynn, um, Jack, I know Stu, and all of us here are here to help you and let's get this thing moving. 
Thank you, Erica. Very well said, as always. Uh, next, you. Jason Parker from Virginia, uh, another union uh, leader that has joined the effort. Jason, your closing statement. Thanks, Jack. Great panel, timely subject. Um, you know, this is an item that cannot be avoided. Our trade competitors use these infrastructure banks to great effect against us. And we talked about these young people, if you're gonna make them stakeholders in the United States of America, you've got to afford them the ability to get a good job. And this is how we do it. And I appreciate being on, thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, next up, uh, Ryan Snow. Uh, Ryan, your closing statement. I wanna say thank you for having me. I'm, I'm honored to be in uh, such a great company and with all the negativity going on in the world, what a positive message of, of hope through this, this bank. All the improvements, all the changes, uh, nothing is impossible if, as long as we have a dream. And I just want to thank you all for everything you've done. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, and one of uh, the real leaders of the coalition who uh, is, has helped us from uh, uh, the beginning and is also advocating for us uh, through the Biden campaign, uh, State Senator Lou De Palma from Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, Lou, uh, your closing statement, thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Jack. And it's, uh, as everyone said, it's great to be a part of a group that I always say, I wanna work with folks who won't take no for an answer. Great group won't take no for an answer and we will bring it over the, uh, the goal line using a football analogy and I think it's on tonight. So people can go watch it soon. No one disagrees about the need for infrastructure investment. There's nothing new here. We've had infrastructure banks in the past, National Bank in the past. We need another one. Let this be the fifth and let, it, let us bring it over the goal line tomorrow. So. Great. Uh, finally, I, I want to um, uh, pass the, uh, 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 the presentation over to Falca Mutardi. Uh, and preference her introduction by saying this, uh, we are now in a rural economy uh, that uh, we must face and challenge uh, each and every country throughout the entire world. And investment in infrastructure is absolutely necessary in order to win that competition. Uh, sad to say, here in the United States, our rate of investment, as far as our economy is concerned, uh, in infrastructure is about 2.3, 2.4%. Uh, compare that to the European economic community, uh, and it is 4.5%. Lastly, compare that to China, and it is 8%. If we don't turn this train around and start being smart about how we invest in our infrastructure and create a more efficient, effective, and fair economy for everyone to have living wages and, and improve our quality of life, we are not going to succeed in the world stage of, of economic development. Alfeca, uh, we would like to have you uh, present your closing statement and uh, expand upon those concepts and others. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jack, and to all of the other participants who've been working on this National Infrastructure Bank proposal. We really appreciate all of your efforts. So from a macroeconomic point of view, putting my macro hat on again, I would say our needs are huge, at least four trillion and counting maybe something much larger, maybe six, maybe eight. We're going to go back to the numbers. Uh, when we, <laughs> uh, there is simply no way to finance this through budgets. It's just impossible. Uh, we are now in a huge recession. So, but even before then, it was it was just impossible. And our infrastructure uh, spending has been falling behind. Now we have this opportunity to create a fifth national infrastructure bank, which will provide the funding and is very uh, has all of the capacity to provide the funding without adding on to budget deficits. And by the way when you're spending this much on infrastructure and you're, uh, you're creating millions and millions of great paying jobs, putting people back to work who've become unemployed by the COVID pandemic, 
putting them into great paying jobs, uh, not, not ones that they have not even been able to s sustain a livelihood on, but paying Davis-Bacon wages with full benefits. All this will supercharge the American economy. And guess what? It will make money for governments who are doing the investments and, and taking the borrowings. Uh, it will uh, return money in the past to governments and it will do so again. So it's really a complete picture for solving our economic and infrastructure problems at the same time. Thanks. Thank you, Alfaka. And uh, I just want to remind everyone that uh, we have a website uh, for the uh, National Infrastructure Bank that uh, I suggest you visit if you have not yet already. And I think we'll be posting that uh, up on the uh, screen now, which uh, we have. And also uh, remind, or if you uh, don't know, uh, we have another webinar planned for October 7th, 2020. Uh, and look at our website for the details. This is going to be, um, a webinar that talks about the bipartisan nature and benefits of what a national infrastructure bank can do. And similar to what was done in the 1930s under FDR, when that uh, particular infrastructure bank obtained bipartisan support in Congress, each and every time uh, 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 the president went uh, to request additional funds uh, to support uh, the huge development of our infrastructure during the 30s and 40s, which not only brought us out of the depression, but also helped prepare us uh, to take on uh, 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 World War II's uh, enemies uh, uh, at that time. Finally, uh, we request your support in lobbying your uh, congressperson and senator in order to support the bill that uh, uh, creates the National Infrastructure Bank, HR 6422. Please call your congressperson at the number that's posted up on the screen, which will connect you. And each and every one's effort will make a difference as far as accomplishing this task, which I view as absolutely necessary to dig ourselves out of the economic crisis that we face and in order to create uh, 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 a circumstance of dignity and, and economic benefit for each and every family throughout the country. Thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to you supporting our efforts in the future. I thank our panelists who did a wonderful job. We greatly value your effort, your support, and your work with us. Everyone have a great evening. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, everybody.